With 2000s fashion coming back in style, I can't help but think about the countless examples we see in pop culture. Our mind goes to Mean Girls, Legally Blonde, and pop icons like Britney Spears that have left their imprint on fashion. In addition, we saw characters express themselves through fashion on cartoons and children's television shows. Totally Spies was not only a show about teenagers having to navigate their double life, but every episode had them wear a different outfit that reflected their unique personalities. Disney Channel was pivotal in launching the careers of stars like Hilary Duff, Selena Gomez, and Miley Cyrus, catapulting them to teen stardom. These girls were everywhere from having their own clothing lines, video games, sold out concerts, and even having perfume. In this video, I want to talk about three girls that not only were important to the history of Disney Channel, but also were so-called fashionistas on their respective shows in the 2000s. So here it goes, the fashion icons on Disney in the 2000s. Lizzie McGuire was a story about a normal teenager, even one of the original titles of the show being What's Lizzie Thinking? Later, loser. On the outside, you can't always say what you think, but on the inside, you can tell it like it is. I've got plenty of advice, just nothing I can say out loud. Get lost, get real, and deal. Oh, he's so cute. No more Miss Nice Guy. I, I mean, girl, I mean, no! And best of all, what you say in your head stays in your head. I have the right to remain silent. Lizzie McGuire, get inside her head. Weekdays at 6, 5 central on Disney Channel. Lizzie McGuire was one of the most impactful young protagonists in the 2000s, specifically targeted towards preteen girls. Lizzie McGuire was a middle schooler and was the first time that Disney Channel was able to significantly profit off a character's likeness and popularity, with kids wanting to not just act, but dress like Lizzie. For example, a dress-up game was created that allowed kids to put together outfits for Lizzie and Miranda that you could still play today. She told stories that young kids could relate to, and Hilary Duff even said how the show related to her life. I was going through a lot of the same things, she said, and the writers would pull a lot of things that were happening in my life and kind of like write them into the show. So drama with friends or having to go bra shopping with my mom, kind of being uncomfortable and klutzy in my own skin and falling down or, you know, whatever kind of was happening. Not that they took all of my life's things, but it was very similar what was happening in my life and what was happening in her life. Lizzie McGuire is described as being a sweet girl who always seems to do the right thing. The family structure of Lizzie fits the perfect image that Disney crafts. She's the older sister with two seemingly happy married parents and a younger brother. Her parents are supportive, with her dad being goofy and her mom wanting to relate to her daughter. Her brother Matt is depicted as being annoying, which Disney Channel shows liked having the older sister-younger brother dynamic, as we saw in Kim Possible, That's a Raven, and Liv and Maddie. She can be clumsy at times, which is mostly played for laughs in the show. Lizzie, like any teen girl, has a crush, hers being on Ethan Kraft. Her main conflict in the show is with her ex-best friend, now popular girl, Kate. The show is structured through her perspective as we hear what she's thinking through her animated self. This type of storytelling further exemplified how young she is. Compared to other Disney Channel shows that might occasionally break the fourth wall, Lizzie McGuire did it on numerous occasions. These are bargain basement pants, people! But they are kind of cool. Lizzie's wardrobe was trendy at the time, with Lizzie McGuire even having a fashion line with Limited 2. So, you and your friends can't make it to Hollywood for a big time premiere party? No problem, the party can come to you. This is brilliant. If you win Lizzie McGuire's premiere party, Hollywood could be coming to your school. You and your classmates could win a premiere screening of a never before seen episode of Lizzie McGuire, hosted by a surprise guest, plus wardrobe from the first ever Lizzie McGuire by Limited 2 clothing line. 500 first prize winners could win a t-shirt from the Limited 2 line. 100 second prize winners could win $25 limited two gift certificates. And there's even more prizes, like Lizzie McGuire books and journals. That's so beautiful! So go to any limited two store, pick up a game piece, scan it at the special display, and you'll find out right then and there if you won a prize. Play Lizzie McGuire's Premier Party Sweepstakes and watch Lizzie McGuire. Oh yeah! On Disney Channel. Her fashion is vibrant and she seems to be experimenting with different trends. There's an episode where she experiments with being goth which results in her wearing all black, which contrasts her usually wearing bright colors. 
Lizzie McGuire's fashion has a brightness that represents her naiveness and adolescence. The costume designers for Lizzie McGuire were Kimberly Adams for season one and Katherine Wagner for season two. One of the most noticeable things about Lizzie McGuire is the hairstyles. Sometimes she uses hair clips, bandanas, headbands, even adding color clip-ons in her hair. Her hair represents this freedom that she has at their team with experimentation and just having fun with what she's wearing. In a Nylon article, they write, Wagner and Adams give Adrutha the lead, the hairstylist behind both seasons, plenty of credit for adding an extra aspirational layer to every character's look. Those girls had so much fun, from my memory of walking into the hair trailer, remembers Adams. Adrutha was so great on the show, she's so talented and it makes a huge difference in the way these girls have hair that looks clever without it being overstated. What a difference that makes, says Wagner. Once you go through great hair and makeup and then you come back and you put on the costume, it's magical. Originally, Lizzie's wardrobe was rather tame, with Adam saying, the show's producers wanted to push Lizzie's style beyond where they started with the character after the pilot. They felt that she was a little too bland, too simple. It was a matter of walking the fine line between her not being the popular girl, but her not being a nerd either. The pilot episode in terms of production order is Pool Party, while the first episode listed on Disney Plus is Rumors. In Pool Party, Lizzie McGuire's fashion is not as vibrant. First, she's shown wearing a white shirt with a flower design on it. Next, she wears a flower headband with a printed pink top and yellow tank underneath. Then a blue striped collared shirt with a red shirt with a white collar underneath. Her final outfit is a varsity tee white shirt with orange sleeves paired with overalls. Lizzie's fashion was mostly because of Hillary, who knew what was popular with her generation. Kimberly purposely made Lizzie's wardrobe focus on bold, vibrant colors that were made to contrast the popular girl, Kate, who was seen wearing pastels. Lizzie was shown mixing colors, patterns, and layering. The youthful nature was represented through her willingness to try new things in the wardrobe. Wagner said in regards to Lizzie's fashion in season two, with each character sticking to a specific color palette, Lizzie's bright and vibrant style was matched with mixing patterns, color blocking, and layering, accessories especially. We kept it young, cheerful, and colorful, says Wagner, who often took graphic tees and embellished them with rhinestones, like a junk food graphic tee in blue emblazoned with American Girl. I wanted her to have a little sparkle, literally and figuratively. You create the attention up towards the face, towards the eye. That's where everything shows. When comparing Lizzie's fashion to Miranda, it was made to contrast one another, which is another trend you see in Disney Channel shows, the best friends being opposite personality-wise and in their wardrobe, with probably the most prominent examples being Hannah Montana, Lily having a sportier style, and Wiz to Waverly Place, Harper's girly and peculiar sense of fashion. While Lizzie channeled her inner Y2K pop star, Miranda's wardrobe leaned more towards Rebel meets Tomboy. She didn't gravitate towards the same combination of things as Lizzie did, explains Adams. She too was her own kind of funky, against the grain kind of gal. And we just kept trying to push that with both of them. The two BFFs had very different styles to the naked eye, but there was always a thorough line between their outfits, whether it was a similar color choice, print, or silhouette. Sometimes friends dress similar or they borrow clothes from each other. So you kind of walk this funny line between each one having their own look, but they're both wearing similar pants, explains Wagner. Lizzie's childhood fashion demonstrated her youth, and even watching Lizzie McGuire the movie, there seems to be a slight change in what she's wearing. She's still wearing prints, but no longer in the same chaos you saw with different colors and patterns. The prints aren't completely gone, as she did wear pants like this. Her outfits seemed more mature, which could represent how she's graduating from middle school and going to high school. There isn't the same mismatch vibrant patterns we saw on the television show. We see her in button-up blouses and simple accessories, the hard tag necklace seen more than once. She goes through a transformation where her outfits consist of dresses and skirts when she's hanging out with Paolo instead of the usual jeans and blouse. The most iconic look of the movie was the contrasting outfits with Lizzie and Isabella. This is the final time with Lizzie and compared to her first, we've watched her grow up. Lizzie's is more silver with hints of purple that matches head to toe. That includes a jacket and flare pants. Isabella is wearing all green with a leather jacket and a green skirt. Overall, the transformation of Lizzie chronicles her experience through middle school and would probably have gone through another transformation if the show continued into high school. Lizzie McGuire's impact on Disney Channel is still felt 20 years later, and the success of her show led to another peer becoming an inspiration herself, which is... That's a Raven was a sitcom with the concept being a young girl being able to see into the future. Some of the names it had at the beginning were The Future Is On Me and Absolutely Psychic. When Raven has a vision about the dad's job, you got fired. 
Anthony. She has to go undercover to get it back. It's showtime! That's So Raven. New episode tonight at 7, 6 Central on Disney Channel. Okay, so her visions are a little off, but her style is always 2020 perfect. That's So Raven. Up next on Disney Channel. Originally, Raven Simone read for the best friend role, Chelsea, but the producers really liked her and the show was retooled with her in the lead role. The show was also Disney Channel's first multi camera sitcom. Raven Simone was a child actor as she had gotten her start on The Cosby Show. Raven Simone's natural ability to make the audience laugh, especially with how funny she was as a teenager, was rare, and the critics loved it. Laura Fries from Variety says In the farcical, that's so Raven, the diva in training, stars as a 15-year-old psychic who handles the knowledge of the future with the sophistication and grace of Lucy Ricardo. If there's a way to solve a problem sensibly, Raven heads straight for silly and turns left at outrageous. And as far as slapstick physical comedy goes, Raven, the actress, is up to the task. The show was the highest rated original in the channel's history, leading to it becoming the first program to reach 100 episodes on the network, breaking Disney's 65-episode rule the one that ended Lizzie McGuire a few years earlier. It was the longest running live action until Wizards of Waverly Place. That's where Raven has had not one, but two spin-offs with Corey in the house and Raven's home. Raven Simone and Hilary Duff were compared as they came up around the same time. Also, due to the fact that their TV character shares their name, there's a lot of similarities in their personalities and experiences. With Girlhood on Disney Channel, branding celebrity and femininity, it says, a 2004 newspaper article by Amy Cooper for the Sydney Sun Herald dubbed Liz McGuire star Hilary Duff the girl next door because she was wholesome and clean living as a result of being too busy with her Disney Channel series to party. In comparison, Cooper dubbed Raven Simone the cool chick, seemingly only based on the fact that she performed the theme song for That's a Raven and was linked to Liz McGuire because they once shared an apartment. Tellingly, Raven Simone was not characterized there as a girl next door alongside wholesome Duff but neither was she bad like Lohan, who is referred to as the bad girl. The differences in their image could relate to their race, as Girl Next Door is usually associated with whiteness and the ability to be relatable to the average viewer. Raven is a typical high school student in every way. She has the same structure of best friends that we saw in the previous show with Chelsea and Eddie, but is hiding a secret. A teenager having a secret that makes their life complicated follows other teen shows airing around this time, with Sabrina the Teenage Witch and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. There is an internal conflict as she should impact the future, which she usually does, especially in situations that would embarrass her friends or herself. That's where Raven has a rather repetitive structure compared to any of the other Disney Channel shows. Raven gets a vision, she tells her friends, decides slash figures out how to stop it, has a goofy costume maybe in order to complete the task, and the vision most likely happens anyways. Raven's character is confident and loyal. She's very sure of herself and struggles to contain the secret that makes her different from her peers. Raven has an identical family structure to Lizzie, with two loving parents and an annoying younger brother. Like Lizzie, she wants to fit in and doesn't seem to get along with the popular kids at school, which we see through a lot of hating her. Raven is known for liking fashion and using it as a way to express herself. In season 4, the show allows her dream to be more of a reality when she lands an internship with world-famous fashion designer Donna Cabana. With Girlhood on Disney Channel, branding celebrity and femininity, it says, Many episodes emphasize Raven's interest in fashion, boys, and other aspects typical of normative upper middle class teen girlhood, such as hanging out in a heavily accessorized bedroom, getting her own telephone line, avoiding her parents' wrath, performing well in school, and in sports, and throwing parties. One of her signature looks is from the opening sequence with a stylish trench coat that's paired with an orange top and flared jeans. Coats and jackets are a big part of Raven's wardrobe as she can usually color coordinate and emphasize how much she likes layering and matching. There is this purple jacket that she wears on top of a light purple turtleneck. There was a long line denim coat that has a purple fur trim which is rather bold and makes her stand out among her peers. Raven exemplifies a decent amount of 2000s trends with one even being flare jeans. Just because Raven was known to be stylish wearing what's trendy doesn't mean she wasn't scared to experiment like with her cowgore outfit that I would probably wear today, complete with cow print from head to toe or the snake print skirt and top ensemble she wears that's complete with a red trench coat. She rocks high ponies, low ponies, and even the half up, half down. More staples were wearing a flower headpiece, varying in size, or bread clips that helped pin back her hair. Chelsea's shown to be stylish as well, her style seeming more thrifted. You could usually see her wearing an opposite color to Raven, like she might wear blue to contrast with Raven mostly wearing warm colors like pink and red. Chelsea wears cooler colors that can also include neutrals as a way to differentiate her personality from Raven. Chelsea is shown to be absent-minded and her fashion makes her blend in with the crowd unlike Raven who wants to stand out. 
Raven Baxter's blackness is rarely mentioned exclusively other than the racism episode where she tries to get a job and the store manager says, we don't hire black people. However, race is underlying in the relationships on the show and its messaging, even if the show doesn't address it on a regular basis. Raven's moment was inspirational specifically to young black girls with her overall confidence in regards to her body and her career. This quote by Blue sums up accurately the conversations around Raven's blackness on the show. Yet the show still manages to traffic in stereotypes of blackness, while also privileging a colorblind ideology in which racial and ethnic differences are rendered insignificant. Rather than being instructed as part of her blackness, Raven's unruliness comes to light via her creativity with costumes. Her disguises allow her to enact certain black stereotypes, but they also help her subvert expectations of middle-class femininity. Raven Baxter's visions can be hard to handle at times, but her drive to make a name for herself through her love for fashion has not been forgotten. In regards to her fashion sense, I can't help but link flare jeans to Raven Baxter. Her love for her friends grounded her, and that leads to her final fashionista. Um, hello, this is Yay, me, not Yay, all you guys. This is the only one on the list that doesn't lead her own show, instead one of the female leads. Sweet Life of Zack and Cody centers on twin brothers, Cody and Zack Martin, who live in the Tipton Hotel, where their mother, Carrie, performs. The series has Mr. Mosby, who runs the hotel, Maddie Fitzpatrick, a teen girl that works there, and London Tipton, the hotel owner's daughter. Now, one of the most common known facts is that London Tipton is a play on Paris Hilton, which isn't uncommon on Disney Channel to parody real people. Chad Dylan Cooper, for example, is a parody of Chad Michael Murray. I'm strictly going to focus on Sweet Life of Zack and Cody because A, the fashion looks better, and B, London's style and character changes a bit in On Deck, and that's a bit confusing. In the Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, they enjoy making it just for you. Hey. Hello, Maji. <laughs> <laughs> Can I name my cat after you? Is it a purebred? Yes! I mean, no! <laughs> oh. I got so caught up in the moment. For Dylan, this is important. I believe I'm back. <laughs> London. Maddie. Whatever your name is. So, did you change your mind about coming to my party? No. I thought if I might... <laughs> Oh, Did I mention you're gonna miss a new episode of The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody? The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, every night at 7.30, 6.30 Central on Disney Channel. Don't we make a great team? London Tipton, played by Brenda Song, hasn't left the audience's mind. Lana Condor talked about how the first time she saw herself represented was with London Tipton. It's hard to remember exactly how I felt when I watched that show as a child and what it meant to me to see someone like me up there. But I do think as a child, I felt simply happy that there was someone up on the screen who looked like me and that made me feel more normal in school. My brother and I were the only Asian kids in our primary school, but I also remember feeling a little awkward because her character was so silly and I would think to myself, but I'm not dumb. Of course, now I know that was the point of her character, to provide the comedy. Brenda Song was one of the few Asian American actresses you saw on Disney Channel, and she wasn't a stranger to Disney Channel before the show. Appearing in movies such as Stuck in the Suburbs and Get a Clue, and having a recurring role on Phil of the Future. She had her first starring role in Wendy Wu, Homecoming Warrior. Ancient mythology and homecoming dances. What part did you enjoy most? <sighs> I'd have to say homecoming dances, because I'd never been to one. So getting ready for this one and the dress and the makeup of the hair, it was really exciting. <laughs> Enough about all that. What about the action scenes? Well, for the movie, I had to learn kung fu and I had to learn wire work. That's how we do all the big kicks and the spins and stuff like that. Can you show us some of your moves? Oh, of course. You gonna join me, Mike? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I do have the, uh, the yellow belt. Oh, nice. OK, well, I'm just going to do a little blue shoe spin and a 360 spin kick, OK? Originally, Ashley Tisdale was going to play London, and Brenda Song was going to play Maddie, but they switched. Compared to the previous two fashionistas, London's not very nice. And in a show that doesn't have a traditional mean girl, it would probably have to be London. London rarely has her family appear on screen, which, to be fair, The Sweet Life has more complicated family dynamics compared to other Disney Channel shows, with Zack and Cody being raised by a single mother. London's birth mother never appears and her father isn't shown on screen till Sweet Life on deck. It can be interpreted that her need to shop and her abundance of doing so is to get the comfort she doesn't get from her father. London's shown to be upset when her father flakes on his commitments like the father-daughter dance. 
Later on in the show, it becomes apparent that Mr. Mosby is a father figure for her, and the people at the hotel are her found family. Mr. Mosby is also the one that teaches her how to drive. Her friendship with Maddie is probably my favorite out of the three girls mentioned. Maddie and London are an example of opposite the tract, with her coming from a big family, not a wealthy background, and being book smart, because they probably wouldn't have met if Maddie didn't work at the hotel. London can be really mean to Maddie, making fun of her quite a bit. However, I do appreciate the time that they are subtly coordinating with their clothing. However, when London becomes poor in the episode Poor Little Rich Girl, Maddie's the one that takes her in as she can no longer afford to stay in her suite. London being part of the 1% makes her different from any of the other television characters. London shows her love for Maddie in the first season episode, Christmas at the Tipton, where she knits Maddie a sweater even if it was badly knit. London's shown to be quite gullible as well, being tricked countless times by other characters. However, when she puts her ego aside, she can be pretty self-aware and selfless. London doesn't have a strong work ethic either because she has never had to work for anything. The only time she really shows some work ethic is when she has her own web show, Yay Me, starring London Tipton. London's web show, Yay Me, starring London Tipton was a way she was able to express herself and show her interests. London has an obvious passion for fashion as she matches head to toe, similar to Raven, and wears a lot of sequins and prints to stand out. She has a need to wear new things every day and not repeat clothing. However, if you pay attention in certain episodes, you can see London re-wearing different pieces. I view her fashion as being more designer and expensive to represent how she sees herself as better than everyone else and as a way to get the attention she doesn't get from her father. London's noted to only wear designer brands, which in the crossover episode, That's So Sweet Life of Hannah Montana, Maddie tries to help Raven get London to wear one of her designs. She layers quite often and contrary to the other girls, does go to a private school, Our Lady of Perpetual Sorrow in season two. This is one of the only times we see her have structure in her life even down to her wardrobe where she has to wear a uniform. London's mostly seen wearing pinks, whites, and blacks. She likes to wear stylish hats, headbands, and earrings. She'd be shown wearing a variety of different shades of pink, from light pink to hot pink. She would mix colors frequently with green and blue, green and brown, black and yellow, orange and blue, and pink and yellow. You also see London wear a variety of different necklines with off the shoulder, halter, and square. She's a princess, so to speak. Also, she loved leopard print, wearing it from her PJs, a top, and as a cute hat. She wasn't a stranger to scarves or boas either. One of my favorite looks is what she wore to the Masquerade Ball in the Cooking with Romeo and Juliet episode, as she's wearing a dark green corset top and a black skirt. London's introduction to episodes was usually getting a long shot of her entire outfit as the audience is supposed to pay attention to what she's wearing, and the spectacle that she is. Compare this to Maddie, who's usually positioned behind the candy counter, mostly seen from the waist up. London's selfish nature, even through her catchphrase, yay me, makes her a character that was able to provide comedic relief to the audience. Although it does show her to be loyal to those she cares about, even if that circle is small. The charm that London had was able to make her stand out to the audience watching and a character that was on screen for six years. I guess to close, here's what Brenda Song had to say about the character. All of the stuff at Disney, I am so grateful that they truly were colorblind casting at that time and giving this little Asian American girl a chance in Hollywood. Here are some last minute thoughts. First, London's net worth is apparently over $2 billion. And I didn't really spend a lot of time on the girls' love interests in this video. So first, there's Lizzie and Gordo, who were the adorable best friends to lovers. And Raven and London don't really have a romantic interest we regularly saw, like Lizzie saw Gordo. With Devin being introduced and then leaving in season 2. And London's longest boyfriend and sweet life being Lance. Which would probably make sense why Raven and Chelsea and London and Maddie were shipped among fans just because we saw them every week and could tell they had incredible chemistry. The Disney fashion icons of the 2000s have stood the test of time through their markability, hundreds of Barbies sold, and their characters being ones that audiences could relate to. Lisa McGuire was the first, and not only did she shed a light to how terrible middle school can be, but she paved the way for the expression and fashion we see through young preteen leads. Raven was pivotal to comedic timing and paved the way for having a black girl lead a teen show, especially with one that has an interest in fashion. Just look at True Jackson VP. And London Tipton was able to steal the show even if she wasn't the main lead. These three girls have cemented themselves in Disney's history and allowed kids to see themselves on screen.